I, Stephen Patrick Carter, Captain of the Parish of Lonnon, having duly received the requisite number of written requests, have decided to hold a requisition meeting to discuss the actions of Mr Andrew Smith, MHK, in respect of the assisted dying legislation recently before the House of Keys. And that meeting uh, is to be held here this evening, tonight, starting now. Now, before... I would just like to say uh, that a requisition meeting, uh, the captain of the parish has no power to compel anybody to come to a requisition meeting. And Mr Smith, uh, I spoke to him, and Mr Smith has agreed himself uh, to come along. He didn't have to come along tonight uh, to put forward his case. And um, in view of that, uh, I, the, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask Mr Smith to, he's going to make a statement uh, to the meeting, and then I will throw the meeting open to questions. So I'm going to call on Mr Smith uh, if he would like to make his statement first. So just uh, if you bear with me, ladies and gentlemen, we will then get round to questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Chairman, thank you for your kind invitation to attend the meeting this evening and for the opportunity for me to detail the facts appertaining to the specific subject of this meeting, my actions regarding assisted dying legislation. At the outset, let me first clarify my journey in politics and community service within the Isle of Man. I freely located to the island with my wife and two daughters with employment in 1986 and chose to live in Laxey. My wife and I still live in the same house, Fig Tree Cottage, Glen Road, Laxey, IM47AJ. We have had a telephone connected to this house since our arrival in 1986, which is 861684. It also has an answering machine in operation. We have never had our telephone number listed as X directory and have no intention of doing so in the future. I have also had a mobile telephone for over 25 years, the number of which has never changed. 491391. I am not new to Manx politics as I served on the board of Laxey Commissioners between 1992 and 2001 and I also contested general elections in Garth in 1996, 2016 and 2021. I rescued Laxey Fair from failure in 1999 and have since been the principal organiser. Also in 1999, Laxey Village entered the Britain in Bloom competition on the island. As chairman of Laxey Commissions at that time, I spearheaded this initiative and Laxey won the best small village category. I was privileged to represent Laxey as Island Man winner at the Britain in Bloom fi finals in Harrogate. On the introduction by Laxey Village Commissioners of attendance allowances for meetings, I requested to waive my right to these allowances. I had freely offered myself for election and it was always my clear understanding and belief that my energy and time expended was for the enhancement of the village and for the benefit of its residents and that I should not gain financially from ratepayers' funds. However, as my request was denied, in 2002, and to coincide with the Golden Jubilee of HM Queen Elizabeth II, I formed the Laxey Recreation Amenities Conservation and Education Foundation charity in which to receive the Laxey Village Commissioner's Attendance Allowance payments. In 2004, this charity also raised additional significant funds to support both the 150th anniversary of the Great Laxey Wheel Lady Isabella and also the refurbishment of the Snaefell wheel, Lady Evelyn. An engraved plaque was placed on the Snaefell wheel to give testimony to this, which is still in place today. From 1998 to 2008, I served on the Isle of Man board of the Prince's Trust. Since 2006, I have had a business interest in Fairy Cottage filling station Laxey, which is widely known. Following the serious flooding in Lax in 2019, I formed the Garth Flood Action Association.
from the major incident being declared on 1st of October 2019, this association became active and continually monitors flooding incidents throughout Garth, collating and disseminating relevant information both to central and local government and also the wider Garth community. I live and work in the real world and in addition to my political responsibilities through my charitable work, I daily interact with one or many of the following. Isle of Man Government Social Services, the Salvation Army Debt Advice Service, the Isle of Man Food Bank, Housing Matters, GRI, Isle of Man Live at Home Scheme, Jerby and Northern Initiatives, Manx Benevolent Fund, Douglas Cole Fund and many endowment committees. From that brief overview, everyone can fully understand and determine that I live and lead a very high profile public life. I have always been exceptionally active within the community and I take all and any official responsibility extremely seriously. I am definitely not a reclusive person, neither do I ever evade challenging or problematic solutions. So now to consider the matter of this evening. During all my general election campaigns, 1996, 2016 and 2021, I have never canvassed on the subject of assisted dying. This has never been a policy or key element of my interest in politics. I commenced campaigning for the 2021 general election on the 21st of July 2021. My team and I successfully and personally visited the homes of 98% of the Garth electorate and I successfully and personally visited the sorry, uh, electorate delivering a personal letter of introduction. My manifesto was mailed to every household registered on the latest available edition of the electoral register, with some constituents receiving a second home visit and personal delivery of my manifesto. Within these printed documents there is absolutely no mention of assisted dying. The subject was raised only once throughout my canvassing during a conversation on the doorstep with one resident in Onken. In the run-up to the 2021 general election, during the various political requisition meetings throughout Garth constitui constituency, the topic of assisted dying was not raised. Mr Chairman, who presided over the requisition meetings in both Laxey School and this hall, Bold Ryan, can confirm that this is the case. Mr Chairman? That's just, uh, to my recollection, that's correct, yes. Regarding the media briefings, only once was the topic of assisted dying raised. At that meeting, although not fully conversant with the issues surrounding assisted dying, I deliberated over the general debate and, in an effort to show some compassion and attempt to view the bigger picture and placing my own personal views to one side, I said I would give support to the issue. Following this, during the remainder of the 2021 general election campaign, no further reference on the doorstep or in public debate was the topic of assisted dying ever mentioned. Regarding the manifestos of the current 24 members of the House of Keys, 19 make no mention of the topic either, which I would respectfully suggest leads me to believe that it was not a key issue of their 2021 election campaigns either. Following my successful election, I have commenced research into the complete subject of assisted dying. To give you the benefit of some of my findings, I will now share a synopsis of the wide range of issues so far considered by me. From a personal perspective, in my early years, as was customary, we cared for my grandmother at home until her passing. This was commonplace to most families at that time. Prior to our marriage, my wife cared for her father for five years. Following our marriage in 1978, my wife and I continued caring for her father who was suffering with heart disease and chronic emphysema. He was highly dependent upon medication, including oxygen. This care continued at home until his death in 1982. Never at any stage during this dying process did we ever consider interfering with the natural process of death. My mother managed to remain in her own home until she was aged 96 in the care of my sister who continued to work. It was only as a last resort because of my mother's failing health and the physical moving and handling responsibilities placed upon my sister that my mother had to eventually go into care where she remained until her natural death at over 100 years of age. 
When something happens regularly, we accustom ourselves to it and we manage it. Today, death in the home is a less frequent visitor. And as with other things there are, they, that are unfamiliar, it can create fear and trepidation. Death and debility have increasingly been banished to hospitals, hospices or nursing homes, with doctors and nurses taking over much of the responsibility for day-to-day -day care as well as clinical treatment. This shift in our present experience of the dying process has meant that what was once commonplace and integrated into our daily family lives has become <coughs> remote and unfamiliar. Not knowing what to ex expect, people take their hints from vicarious experience, television, films, novels, etc. These sensational yet simultaneously trivialised versions of dying and death have replaced what was once everyone's common awareness of, of observing the dying of people around them and living through the death of a family loved one within their midst. Prior to the debate in the House of Keys on the 24th of May 2022, I researched further the existing legislation in a number of jurisdictions including the Netherlands, Switzerland, Belgium, Canada, Australia and the United States of America, particularly the state of Oregon. I also reviewed the various debates held within England, Wales, Scotland and the Republic of Ireland. The more I explored in depth, the more complex the issues became. This is an absolute minefield of differing opinions and practices, with some countries either not upholding the in initial principles of their law on assisted dying as first enacted, or alternatively weakening and diluting the principles and safeguards of the law to suit the circumstances. It is because the law should have is it because the law should have been better safeguards, or is it because the mere existence of such law is an invitation to see assisted suicide as a normality instead of a last resort? At the outset I knew this task would be fraught with difficulty, and this has certainly proven to be the case. I then turn my focus to the Isle of Man and ask myself the question, if this is such a burning issue, why do we hear so little about it and why was it not a major issue of public concern at the general election in 2021? Then I contemplated, unlike many parts of the UK, our island has access to a very broad and well-established palliative care provision. Our healthcare professionals, working within all aspects of our healthcare system, dedicate their lives to caring for others. It is not just a profession but their vocation. They have chosen to care for others and part of that care is to show compassion, diagnose the medical symptoms and then often battle to prolong and save life. Dame Cicely Saunders founded the first modern hospice and more than anybody else was responsible for establishing the discipline and the culture of palliative care. She introduced effective pain management and insisted that dying people needed dignity compassion and respect as well as a rigorous scientific <coughs> mythology in the testing of treatments. She abolished the prevailing ethic that patients should be cured, that those who could not be cured were a sign of failure and that it was acceptable and even desirable to lie to them about their prognosis. She put pay to the notion that dying people should wait until their painkillers had worn off before they received another dose and scotched the notion that the risk of opiate addiction was an issue in their pain management. The onset of dying should be acknowledged and, when treatment becomes ineffectual and illness irreversible, the focus should change from the struggle against disease to that of caring for the dying. I am not, nor do I try to be proficient in medical practices or terminology, but one has to gain some knowledge to better understand the implications when debating the important subjects of government, statute and policy. We are fortunate to have with us this evening Dr Ben Harris, who has spent the last 30 years at Hospice Isle of Man. Mr Chairman, it would be most appreciated and relevant if Dr Harris could add at the end of my discourse, during the time for questions, a little extra information from his vast experience to inform both my own and others present with a better understanding of this very sensitive and exceptionally complex issue. Noting that the UK is our biggest trading partner, a common law jurisdiction, the fact that we also operate a reciprocal healthcare system where healthcare professionals freely interrelate and that we are culturally very similar, 
I spent some considerable time researching the various attempts to introduce assisted dying through both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. On the 11th of September 2015, Rob Morris, the time, that, that time MP for Wolverhampton South West, rose to his feet in the House of Commons to introduce his assisted dying bill number two. It was designated number two because there was another, almost identical private member's bill in the House of Lords, at the same time in the name of Lord Falconer of Thornton. It had been tabled a week or so before Mr Morris's bill. After Mr Morris had resumed his seat, a large number of MPs spoke, sometimes with passion for or against the bill. A division was called, 118 MPs voted to support the bill, 330 voted to reject it. Consequently, the bill fell. Mr Morris's attempt to change the law was not the first of its kind. Between 2003 and 2005, Lord Joff had tabled three similar private member bills in the House of Lords. None of them had made progress, and in May 2006, the last bill was put to a vote in the chamber and rejected by 148 votes to 100. In 2013 and 2014, Lord Falconer had introduced similar bills, the second of which reached its committee stage but progressed no further. One analyst commented on Lord Falconer's 2014 bill, it is the equivalent of putting up notices on a railway embankment to warn the public against trespassing, but not putting any fencing in place to discourage or prevent people from wandering onto the tracks. Lord Falconer currently has tabled another assisted dying bill in the 2020-2021 session of Parliament. This has completed the first reading and is progressing through the second reading. However, the UK Parliament has done more than consider a succession of assisted dying bills. In 2004, in response to the second of Lord Joff's three private member bill, a select committee of peers was established to examine the subject in depth under the chairmanship of Lord Mackay of Clashfern, who had been Lord Chancellor from 1987 to 1997. The committee took its work very seriously. In the nine months between its first meeting and its report, it cross-examined over 140 witnesses, many of whom were scientists and specialists in fields including medicine, law, mental health and ethics. It gathered some of its evidence by visiting three overseas jurisdictions, the US state of Oregon, the Netherlands and Switzerland, where assisted dying in one form or another had been legalised. It also invited members of the public to write in with their views. The response was over 12,000 emails or letters. Some of them were brief statements of support for, an oppos for or opposition to a change in the law, others were longer commentaries on specific aspects of the subject. The committee's three-volume report, when it was published in April 2005, ran to nearly a thousand pages. It is probably fair to say that it has been the most comprehensive examination of this subject in Britain to date. Evidence received by the committee raised serious doubts about whether assisted dining should be legalised. However, opinion with the committee was divided on the question and its report summarised the evidence received on both sides of the argument and presented a balanced analysis of the issues. Although the political debate on assisted dining has continued since the report was published, much of its contents and analysis remains relevant today. I am in the process of obtaining a copy of this report to enable me to continue my detailed research into this topic. On the 24th of May 2022, the Honourable Member for Ramsey, Dr Allenson, requested that leave be given to introduce a private member's bill to enable adults who are terminally ill to be provided at their request with specified assistance to end their own life and for connected purposes. It was as a consequence of the volume of information gained from my research and having listened to the number of uncertainties and concerns quite rightly raised by other honourable members during the House of Keys debate that I considered there were just too many anomalies for me to be able to give the proposed my private members bill my support and have a clear conscience. I remain convinced that while sharing the genuine anxieties and abhorrence that people have concerning inadequate care, unrelieved suffering and inappropriate treatments, I maintain that these can be overcome without resort to assisted dying. 
the hospice movement has shown that pain can be eliminated or considerably eased in almost all cases with the proper administration of drugs and other treatments. Sophisticated palliative skills are also available, while expert counselling can relieve the emotional and psychological turmoil that is often associated with the approach of death. Having lived on the island and in Laxey since 1986, I am well aware of and attuned to grassroots politics. The meeting this evening has come as no surprise to me, however, I am somewhat mystified as to the motive. Since the vote in the House of Keys on the 24th of May last, I have not received any negative letters, emails or disgruntled comments from constituents within Garth or indeed throughout the island. All letters received by me, either at my Timwald office or at home, are date stamped upon receipt and filed in Timwald. All my emails are monitored and securely held on the government servers. No emails have been deleted by me since my election. My office telephone is linked to the computer system and all missed calls are recorded. All these processes are in place to ensure that I fully comply with the law and freedom of information procedures. On Saturday 21st of May I held a political surgery in Laxey which was well advertised in, van in advance throughout the village and online. In attendance with me was the newly elected chairman of Garth Commissioners. The purpose of this joint meeting was to ensure that between us we will be able to respond to a wide range of constituency issues that may arise. This would have been an ideal opportunity for anyone who wished to air their opinions on assisted dying to attend. Those constituents who did attend had other issues with no mention of assisted dying. On the Friday the 3rd of June I attended the Cool Roy Jubilee party. I had numerous conversations and there was no mention of assisted dying. On Saturday 12th of June I attended the Mackle Social Club Jubilee party. I had numerous conversations and there was no mention of assisted dying. On Thursday the 16th of June, I attended the Higher Education Fair at Balakameen High School. Many, many young people and students. I had numerous conversations and there was no mention of assisted dying. On Saturday the 18th of June, I attended Armed Forces Day. Same story. On Saturday the 25th of June it was Laxey Fair. As the principal organiser I was on the fair field from 8am in the morning until 5pm in the evening. As many will know this is supported by Laxey School and therefore those in attendance were predominantly from Laxey and or Garth. I had countless conversations and this was an ideal opportunity for anyone to raise any constituency concern which some did but no mention of assisted dying. On Sunday 3rd of July I was in attendance at the Timble Garden Party, a very political event. Again, numerous conversations about constituency and island political issues, but no mention of assisted dying. On Tuesday 5th of July, Timble Day, a major day in the political history of the Isle of Man Parliament. I am surrounded by keen political scrutineers and a major media presence, yet no mention of assisted dying. On Saturday the 6th of July I was in attendance at Mackle Parish Day. Again, numerous conversations but no mention of assisted dying. On Sunday 17th of July I was in attendance at the Laxey Dog Club annual show. Again, same story. More recently, on Saturday the 13th of August I was in attendance at the Royal Manx Agricultural Show. Despite the date of this visit taking place only days following a newspaper article regarding me and a sister dying, during the numerous conversations held, no one raised this issue. Yes, farming issues, but nothing about a sister dying. From this vast array of events attended by me, everyone can fully comprehend the diversity of population mix and age demographics in which I have circulated, a true reflection of everyday life on the island as we know it. As mentioned, I am not a recluse. I regularly meet with constituents on Laxey Promenade 
at one or other of the catering outlets. I am often in Laxey Village, either in the post office, co-op, chemist or Laxey pit stop. Many constituents are also patrons of Fairy Cottage Villa Station and I often discuss political topics of concern and interest there. When time permits, I attend monthly meetings of both Onken District Commissioners and Garth Commissioners. Constituents are also free to visit my home, which some have done. When I am not at home, I am either in my Timwood office or not very far away. I have only been off island twice in the last two years, once on a Commonwealth Parliamentary Association visit to Jersey for three days, and once on a Government Day visit to Liverpool. When I have been off island or I am away from my office, the Timble staff team in legislative buildings know of my whereabouts and have full authority to contact me regarding any issues urgently if necessary. There is absolutely no excuse for anyone not being able to make contact with me directly. It is very disappointing and a sad reflection on those who believe that they could not or would not write to me openly regarding assisted dying. It is also worth noting that there is an increasing tendency within the media nowadays to focus on human interest stories rather than on careful analysis of the facts. Assisted dying is a very sensitive and deeply emotive issue and should not be sensationalised in word or deed. For anyone, including the media who may wish to arrange a meeting with me at a venue of their choice following this meeting, I will welcome the opportunity. Mr Chairman, in conclusion I believe that I have given an extensive exposition of my unstinting commitment and community service to Laxey Garth and the wider island population. I have given an in-depth review of my research to date regarding assisted dying, which I can reveal is only the tip of the iceberg. I have acquiescently shared with the meeting my interactions with constituents over the last few months and I believe that I have given a full and candid response to the topic of the meeting this evening, my actions regarded assisting dying legislation. For the purposes of openness and transparency, I will be using pertinent parts of this dialogue ad verbatim, together with the sequence of events leading up to this meeting in either the House of Keys or Tinwald at the first suitable opportunity. I have nothing further to add at this time. Mr Chairman, once again thank you for your kind invitation and also my grateful thanks to those of you who have made the effort to give up your time to attend this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to now invite questions from the floor. Uh, so if somebody uh, wishes to ask a question, if you could put your hand up, I'll try and get round everything. Mr Tomlinson, start. Uh, question for you, Captain Carter. Can you... Oh, excuse me, sir, I'm not here to be questioned. Neither am I, really. But I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I'm chairing the meeting, I'm not really... Anyway, go on. It's about what did the requisitioners of this meeting actually request? The requisition letters that I got, and I will read them to you. I thought this might come up, and I have it here. There were a number of letters, uh, and the only letters where I have the number of 12, which is the required number, said, To Stephen Carter, Captain of the Parish, Cloughton Stones, Main Road, Belgium. Dear Sir, I we request you to call a public meeting to discuss the behaviour of elected House of Keys member for Garth, Mr Andrew Smith. His blatant misleading of the electorate regarding his commitments to support assisted dying legislation. Signed. And that is it. No mention of anything else. There were some letters that mentioned other subjects, but there weren't 12 of them. And therefore, I'm not prepared to discuss any subjects tonight except assisted dying. Gentlemen, at the back there. Mm -hmm. uh, David Dory Cox, I live in Michael. Um, I was bemused to, to hear about this meeting because throughout my adult life, and you can see from the grey hairs on my head, it's a fairly long life, a lot of it lived in the Isle of Man. 
the principle of ele elective democracy is surely that we ask people to dedicate themselves to public service to research in detail complex and difficult subjects and reach a conclusion. For this meeting to be called at this early stage in the debate leaves me worrying that we've lost that principle where we're asking our elected representatives to do just what Mr. Smith has obviously been doing in ways that we don't have the time or the ability to do and to wrestle with those complex subjects before coming to an opinion. To ask for our elected representatives to pre-list all the things they will support undermines the purpose of Tingwald, the House of Keys, consultations and uh, presentations, surely. The whole purpose of the process that has begun is to encourage our NHKs to go away and do the research and come back with that research and, and come to a conclusion on our behalf. So I'm deeply concerned at the calling of this meeting early in the stage. I realise there's a procedure for doing it, but I would actually like to thank Mr Smith for the detailed research he's done, for the conclusions he's reached, and even if I disagree with them, or with other NHKs, at least I know the work's been done. So I would commend you and thank you for it, Mr Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Smith. Um, I'd like to slightly counter what Mr Doricott suggested, in that Mr Smith's comment in Tinwall was that um, he voted against the assisted dying bill on the basis of his faith and the connection with the Salvation Army. And that seemed to me in opposition to what you said at the Studio One election where you said you'd um, listen to the electorate and follow what they felt. And I, I do feel very strongly that you're, as an elected representative, you certainly are allowed to follow your conscience and vote in that way, and or, or you're allowed to find out what your electorate wish you to vote and you can vote that way. But what you can't do is tell them you're going to vote the way all the electorate want you to and then switch when it comes to the actual vote. You have to choose and be consistent. Either maybe you're voting on your conscience and your faith or what you feel that the electorate in the majority of them want. And that's where I feel you've got it slightly wrong. Well, in answer to that question, I'm happy to answer. I don't have to answer a question, but I'm happy to answer that question. Um, on that particular debate, I tried to set my faith and my personal um, this, the personal feelings to one side to be try and show more compassionate and look at the broader picture. But once once you're elected, then just because you've made a or a, 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 a statement during pre-election with based on I didn't have all the base the the, the um, privilege of all this information here, and surely. Um, just as we see now with the with the prime minister elections in in the UK, both are promising all kinds of things which will never be delivered once 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 election. So mind change will take place, and I, I'm a great believer that as uh, important information comes to light, and you've got the benefit of tried and trusted, tested legislation in other places, and what's not working, then you have got the opportunity to protect the people that you're serving by a change of mind if required. But you didn't say in Timbal that it was based on research and uncertainty. You said it's based on your faith and it, your initially, and then there was some re research later. But this research came later, didn't it? As I said, as I just said in here, as I've said tonight, I've articulated. I don't think I could have articulated the process and the dates that, you, that I've given freely more with more clarity than I've, I've done. That, and it's all recorded. And I'm happy with that. I'm sorry. Andrew, just by what you just said there, is the fact that basically in Tinwald you voted based on your faith and then you did the research afterwards. No, I did some research before. You did I, some did, I did some re I did I research, I was sitting here, I researched Netherlands, Canada, um, United States, Switzerland, the various things, and I saw that they'd been diluted. Their, they'd been diluting their original, and this. When I'll read it again to you. I'll read. I'll read it again to you. Not the whole lot. Not the whole lot. Can we just get back to the point, though? That if you've done that research beforehand, why would you vote based on faith? Yes. 
so, sorry, for what? If you've done the research beforehand, yeah. why stand in Timwall and say it's based on faith and... I said both in Timwall. I, I made members clear that it was based on some research I'd done and also my faith. Okay, so by your account then, research, you've read some papers, I you've have. looked at the way the laws have been diluted. I have. Any studies in there? And I have also, and the, the thing was, the thing, and I'll just read this little bit, which is the actual uh, Dr. Allinson's, and this is the little bit that is very worrying, that leave be given to introduce a private member bill to enable adults who are terminally to be provided at their request with specific assistance to their end their own life and for connected purposes. Now, hang on a minute. What... What are connect? What are connected purposes? We're now in a situation in the Netherlands, I believe, where children as young as twelve. Sorry, all so bills that go through Timwall have unconnected purposes in them. Yeah, well, that's, that's the statement. And it may well be. MHK, it may well be. I understand that, but it's still a worry to me. So okay, I'm sorry. But hold on a second. If you understand that, and every bill goes through with it. How is it therefore a concern as well? It was still that was a major concern in this context of assisted dying. So why would you not even entertain the debate within Timbal? Because that's what the vote was actually. It for. was for, but I couldn't. I could not. So you wouldn't. You no. wouldn't debate it I based on no, I a sentence within it. it. Based on my feelings at the time, I could not, hand on heart, continue with the debate. Okay, but if we just take this step. Back slightly, you contested the election in 2016, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you were there. I was. Yeah. I stood there and I voted. However, I was also at the St. Indians High School for Sixth Form debate. Yeah. And in the 2016 debate, there was a very hotly contested part of the election due to pro-choice, which is very clearly linked to a sifted diet. Yeah. Hey. What did you tell the Sixth Forms at that meeting? I w was I there? Yes, you were there. And I can't remember, I honestly can't remember that 2016. What that I believe that you voted, that you okay. told people that you would vote against pro choice for women due to your religious beliefs. Could, have, could well have been, could well, yeah, I probably did. Okay. So I'm, still, I'm probably still worried about that, I'm still worried about that possibly to a certain extent, I must admit. So it is based on faith though? There's certain elements of faith because faith is part of your makeup, part of your being. But should faith directly influence what the state does? Well, I believe I believe in a, in a Christian country as we are, we, we are from the last census we are still a Christian country. Then I cannot see why faith can't be part of. And the thing is that people know exactly where I stand regarding faith. I've never ever hidden the fact since I've been here in '86. Everybody knows what my position is, and and I was they were still happy to support me and vote. So what's the problem? The problem is the fact that your faith is what is making the decisions, rather than your conducted research. Well, I, d I don't know. I mean, I mean, I can't. I can't say that the the amount of research that I've done into the House of Lords and the House of Commons is all to do with my. It's nothing to do with my faith. This is I'm researching from a from a jurisdiction which is literally our biggest trading partner across the water. You didn't do that before the debate, though. Sorry? Well, you didn't do all well, of that there before the... There is, a, there is a time limit to how much you can do on this research, you must admit. There is a time, I mean, we've done a lot, but you can, there's only so much you can do before. So I stated on I stated on the facts I was aware of at the time, and I'm happy to do that. And from further information, I will stand by that. I'm not, there's no, there's no I have no have no way I will stand by it. So you wouldn't entice a debate into something because it's failed somewhere else? Because that's what you're saying, by those House of Lords bills, by those Commons bills, you won't have a debate within Tinwall because it has failed so Well, I, I, won't, so I, wouldn't support, I wouldn't support it. No, they can have a debate, and I'm happy to be part of it, but I will be, I'll be against the principle. So why did you vote against the debate if you're happy for them to debate it? No, I said I voted against the debate because I had to make a stand at the outset. But the, the debate, we, we, we lost 24-2. We'll be realistic, so we know the debate will happen. There are only two of us that voted against it. So debate will happen. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that because that's politics, that's what happens. But I would still, I still will vote against it as and when, and speak out against it with, within any debate. So, so debate will happen, irrespective. Right. So when you said during the election you tried to be compassionate towards people. Yeah. 
that that doesn't matter because well I was trying to be but the overwhelming evidence is, is just that well, totally out it's just it, 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 it's impossible and hopefully people that have got the what, what you I'm not a medical I'm not I'm not a medical man but hopefully for what other people say tonight from a medical perspective will prove that palliative care is ideal and it's it, it, there's not a problem and we've got a great hospice on the Isle of Man I'm sorry but can we, can, we, what sorry, can we move on? So is this a, is this a discussion? Yeah. We're just going around in circles here. But I, 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 take your, I, take, I do take your point. We're going around in circles. So, gentlemen at the back, by the window, please. Thank you. Uh, should we remember that there are other people, other NHKs, that express concern, and that Dr. Allenson, as far as I remember, his last words were, I've got a lot more research to do. And I think that's relevant. Also, the gentleman in the front, who was pre-researched everything, has spent the whole evening on his phone. So he can't really be listening to... Uh, what I'm taking notes. Well, oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't look like that to me. I'm taking anyway. notes. Yes, well, let's not fall out about uh, the triviality here, please. Let's fall out. Gentlemen, just at the back there, please. It's, yourself, it's a contentious issue. I'm just wondering, with other contentious issues as well as this, is there a possibility for like a, a vote to get a bad off the constituents? So you said yourself you knew it was going to be more contentious. Is there a possibility in the future with other things that might possibly come up as well that you could actually, instead of just getting a small minority that maybe shout the loudest, you get a proper feel for what, I know it's not usually done around politics, but is there a possibility that? I, I, there are procedures for these things and you would effectively have to have a special vote and whether there was a procedure for that in Tinwell, I'm to say that I do not know. No. If Andrew wants to do a quick vote, would you be willing to vote for that? Yes, you would. Well, how would, how would you conduct it and how would you, how, how would you, how would you, you know, I, I think we're getting off the subject there and, and uh, how, there's no, no easy way of doing that, is there? From that point of view, yeah. Sorry, uh, Mr. Perkins. Thank you, Captain Parrish. Um, I'd just like to remind you, Andrew, that on the hustings, 32nd minute, when Richard Slee asked us about the cystic dime, you said it's a very difficult balance from when you feel the time is right for that particular action to take place. I would support that, and I think the government need to grasp the nettle and hear and decide how we can help through legislation. I fully support it. Yeah, I did. Now, I was that. This is about assisted dying. It's not, uh, you, you said that you weren't approached by various people. I had a totally different experience. There were three people in Onken who were given uh, six months to live, and they all mentioned assisted dying. Uh, that was two in Lakeside Gardens and one um, farther down. Now, this is compassion to the person who has no chance of surviving and they wish to main, bring their own life to an end. They, you know, they cannot breathe. Uh, it's a, the case of David Niven and motor neuron disease. It's not about the general elderly person who needs palliative care. This is about giving people the power over their own destiny. The other thing I would say tonight is that leaving that to one side, misleading the electorate at the hustings and doing something else when you get in, that is what's got a lot of people's goats up. And I know we're only discussing assisted dying, but you change your view. And, and the sewage system, when you got in, you, you were going to support the uh, best phylaxy, coming in all the way through. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not, just, not, I'm just I'm sorry, the case not here to discuss the sewage system. This has been called for one reason and one reason only, and that is the only subject that I'm prepared to allow to be discussed. Okay, Captain Carter, thank you for that. Thank it's you. about misleading the electric. Anyway, saying one thing and doing something else. Uh, despite, if you'd come out and said, I haven't done my research, I'm, I'm not going to comment on it, fair enough. But coming out and saying you're going to support it, that is what people are upset about. Martin, and the reason, the, the reason... Can you just repeat what you said again, because I didn't put this car went past. Oh, sorry. Can you just repeat what the first thing you said? Very slowly, so you can all take it in, please. Right. To me, it's... Give both eight of please. Sorry? You know, eight of From Studio One. Oh, from Studio One, right. Okay, yeah. Very slowly. Right, okay. Mr. Smith said in the 30-second minute, you can still see it on the internet, when Richard Slee asked the candidates what their views were on assisted dying, 
Mr. Smith said it's a very delicate balance from when you feel the time is right for that particular action to take place. I would support that and I think the government need to seriously grasp the nettle here and decide how we can help through legislation. I fully support it. Now, that is saying one thing and doing something else when you actually get in the house. If he come out and say, I've still got a lot of research to do, then people would have accepted it. And the reason that people will not speak to Andrew on it is because they know his views on it. And, you know, we've all had instances in business where you're the last to find out something that's been going on because people will not discuss it with you. And that is why you've not had any feedback, Andrew. Well, that's not my fault, is it? People can feedback whatever they want. But I've said, as I said, and I, I try to outline it there, I know that what I said at the Richard Sleeney Bill, what I said there, that, oh, that, and I wasn't fully conversant with it, I know that, but I tried to put aside my own personal beliefs and look at the bigger picture and give it a chance. But unfortunately, on the basis of the other evidence that I've got since, and looking at the, and looking at the overall world situation where, and countries where assisted that, it's, not, it's just not working to, what they, to, the, to the standards that they, they said it would. In the, and look at the legislation yourself. It's been diluted, watered down. And I'd just, I'd just like, obviously, some medical people to, to try and explain to us a little bit more about the, the benefits of what you mentioned about motor neurons or whatever, where the hospice is, is, is here to help. That's what, I'm, what, that's what I believe, the hospice is there with palliative care to help whatever medical situation, whatever, whatever um, dire circumstances people find themselves in, the care provision is there and with the hospice is one of, the, I would say, one of the best in the UK, if not the best, and it should be supported and Dr Harris is here, can tell you all about it. Well, putting that to one side for a minute, I don't dispute that for one minute, but if you look at the personal choice that people would like to have, I want to decide what happens to me. I don't want some doctor in hospice um, deciding I want to go along with it. And the, the problem we've got now is if you decide to take yourself off to Switzerland, that's fine, but your relatives are going to get clobbered by it. And this business, you're comparing us with the UK. Why should we compare ourselves with the UK? We're the Isle of Man. We can decide what we want to do. We should be um, talking to the talking to the, um, the vast numbers of constituents. They all believe that it, we should open up the laws and make freedom for the personal choice the number one thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a gentleman second row from the back of the black T-shirt. Somebody up on the second row, back on this side. Was asked, was asked well, as, as just in the comment to Martin that. Um, I, I knew Daphne's position on assisted dying perfectly well, but that didn't put me off allowing me to state to her what my views were. So I think your comment there that uh, people wouldn't approach because um, they would be shy about or feel that uh, embarrassed or uh, for whatever reason, I think most people would bend their MHA's ears on you know, a whole matter of things on the Isle of Man. And I think, you know, taking into consideration, you know, what other dominions do is, is probably a good, a good idea, don't you think, to sort of see where they've gone right and gone wrong. And I think that's possibly one of the advantages of living on the Isle of Man, that we can actually look at the mistakes that have been made. I think Mrs. Kendish was next. Week. Yes, I think that it's shown in, in the question that's been asked tonight that there's concern that... Uh, Andrew's convictions within the Salvation Army are his motivation for coming to his answers. And I would say that people don't really understand. What was written in the Facebook was that it was because of Salvation Army doctrine. Salvation Army doctrine is in mainstream Christian church. What Andrew has to consider, and people who are in the Salvation Army have to consider, is Salvation Army principles and their own principles of conscience. And subject to personal conscience, matters regarding euthanasia, abortion, gambling, etc. I was at the hustings when Andrew stated that assisted dying, the dying bill, was still being debated, and as such he would look at all the facts before coming to any conclusions. And I believe that is what he's doing. 
There are those who seem concerned that Andrew didn't put his uh, fact that he was a, a Christian and a Salvationist on his manifesto. I know that there are other MHKs who are atheists and agnostic, and I don't recall that that was put on their manifesto. And I know that people would not have put an X in the box if they had realised those facts. Because people's beliefs affects their attitudes and their actions and their convictions. Regarding assisting dying, it's important that there's a balance of principles and that's maintained. And while understanding the argument that people have as to why there should be considered assisted dying, if not given thoughtful consideration, it opens a floodgate for abuse. <coughs> I've been widowed twice. My first late husband for eight years couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't feed himself, couldn't dress himself. He went where I took him, he did, he, put in, he ate what I put in his mouth. But there was never one moment when I felt that his life should be taken deliberately. Medicines were removed so that nature could take its course. But it was not my remit to play God in matters of life and death. And that would not have been his wish. My second late husband suffered a huge heart attack because of the intensive amount of chemotherapy that he was receiving. And again, it was not his wish to hasten the day when he died. It was not his wish to artificially end his life. And he was positive about his future, knowing that it might be days, it might be months, it might be some time and that his physical ability might be changed. But there was never a question at any moment that either of my late husbands would have wanted to become involved with assisted dying. Andrew has a right to his principles. The world will become a much sadder place if folk, and particularly our politicians and our leaders, if they fail to stand up and be counted on things that are important, on moral issues, it takes courage. It takes courage not to just follow the thoughts of others, the other 22, but to stand by their convictions and their principles. And Andrew is such a man of courage. He's a man of integrity. He's a good and honest man an intelligent man who has the concerns and the care of his constituents. And foremost in his thinking and his actions, he is a man of positive convictions. And as such enough, I believe we're fortunate to have him as an MHK. Yes, I'm trying to get everybody a question first, so rather than two to one. Mr. Jessup, can you want to Yeah, um, as somebody that openly declared that they were a humanist in their manifesto, so uh, <laughs> get that out of the way. <laughs> um, I didn't think I was here to actually debate the pros and cons of uh, assisted dying. Yeah, My yeah, understanding yeah. was that it was to actually get to the bottom of why you had declared one particular um, viewpoint at election time, but didn't think it necessary to actually come and talk to the electorate before you changed your mind. Yeah. And as I say, it seems to me that it wasn't, uh, you know, particularly based on any research that you did at the time. It ca it came back down to your own viewpoint in terms of you know we've heard a lot about your face today. So again, it's this technicality of you know how you approach things, you know, and if you are a man of integrity and all the rest of it, then yes, if you're going to change your mind, we all do from time to time, because if the facts change, what do you do, you know? But in this case, my understanding is there was no communication with the electorate that you were thinking of uh, 
doing something different to the pledges that you take in election time. So that was one thing I think you need to uh, explain is, you know, your thought processes between what you put in your election manifesto and how you've come to a different conclusion further down the line. And secondly, I'd like you to comment on the fact that I think, you know, uh, I find it very disappointing that you are attacking those people that wish to hold you to account over this matter. You know, your 20-page letter that you uh, written, uh, wrote and, and, and read out, as I say, I, I think that was quite insulting to, to those people that asked for a requisition meeting, which is their right, and, and as I say, I think you ought to apologise to those people for the very disparaging and patronising way in which you have spoken to everybody at this meeting, who had a legitimate concern in terms of how you had arrived at changing your mind from when you stood for election. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as I've already explained regarding the change of mind from pre-election to 24th of May, which is which was time when I also researched. Well, so we're talking about a change of mind, not over the election period, but prior to the election, when I mentioned on Studio One to 24th of May, whenever it was, when we discussed in Timwell. So the process of my change of my mind was in that as as part of the research. So that's the answer to that question. Um, regarding the other question, I am disappointed that people, whatever, and, and I don't agree with everybody, and they don't agree with me, I understand that, but I cannot believe that as an elected representative, people won't come to approach me and speak about anything, just say, hey Mr Smith, I don't agree, can you, know, can you speak about this at some stage and take me one side? So I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not accepting your disparaging, that I've made any disparaging comments. I believe that they are valid. And obviously, the names will come out as and when we get the freedom of information request. So no one can hide behind a private letter to the captain of the parish for such a meeting, because they need to stand. Just as I'm standing up and be counted, we don't. In fact, it may well be, and this, and Mr. Uh, the captain will uh, agree to this tonight. The very people that requested the meeting may not be here tonight, and I didn't need to be here tonight, and I still don't need to be here. And I still don't need to answer any questions, yes, so but I'm doing it from my own free will because I'm happy to be. You are a representative of the people. I am. So, so for you to, to try and make out that, that you're more concerned about who it is rather than the subject matter, well, not again, is, is, is sort of quite concerning in many respects that you're now out to attack I'm those not, people. Yes, you, are, yeah. you want to actually out these people no. so that they can then be criticised. It's not a case of attacking well, anybody. Yes, this is, we, we, it's not it's, a case of attacking anybody. It's, it's, why can we not... A legitimate political process that people have engaged in, which is calling for a requisition meeting, to ask their representative to be held to account, and you are effectively, you know, belittling those people, attacking those people, questioning their motives, Yes, and because that, that, I don't think they're open. In a democracy, I have got to, I've got to abide by openness, transparency, and all the mm. other things. Why are we not all on the same? Why, why, are, why are we not all on the same page? So, that's literally why the meeting was called, like so that it could be open and transparent. I'll quite happily stand and sit here and say I was one of the people who wrote the letter. Well, we are we because there. of the fact that I didn't feel comfortable approaching you in the middle of the street while I'm say taking my children to school. And having this we debate. Can, I mean, we say, we say hello on the road every day. You say, hey, Andrew, when you get a minute, can we have a chat? But Never happened. Never no, happened. Because I didn't feel comfortable to do it. No, that's your choice. Not because I didn't want. Thank you. But because I didn't feel comfortable. And I'm sorry. But the fact that you would then insinuate that you're going to put a freedom of information request in to find out the names of the people that would like to see you. Well, why, here, why not? That's my prerogative, is it not? It, the thing is, though, the way that you're saying it, sounds as though the, the people that would be on there would be then like marked in some way shape or form and i'm sorry but i have to agree with andrew in terms of the fact that the way that you're treating the people that have called the meeting is belittling yeah. yeah i don't believe that i believe we should all be open if we move if this we're is planning to move together as an island nation as a as a dem democratic thing then we all need to be open and honest with each other and speak openly about our concerns and meet and if we meet, if we agree to disagree, disagree, we'll actually have a, a sensible, civil conversation and mo let's move forward. But that's not the political process. This is. 
which is why it was called. Well, this is on the other side of things, though, why them? would you then request our names? Um, sorry. Have we had one? Have, have we had a similar meeting as this before? We haven't, have we? As I have to say, that as far as I'm aware, and I have asked some of the other captains of the parish, there's never been a requisition meeting. As far as anybody knows, I'm not saying that there hasn't. You know, obviously, I'm not party to them going back hundreds of years, which is the case. Uh, but as far as the current council of the parish knows, there hasn't been a requisition meeting to challenge or to question a sitting MHK. But that's due to also the fact that we don't have, say, a recall mechanism and things. Well, that may be, but 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 that's not, you know, that, 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 and it may be that I'm I'm wrong in what I'm saying, but that's as far as I've been able to ascertain. That's all I can say. Yeah. The fact that we've never had a requisition meeting on this subject before shows how important it is for people to call it. It it, 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 it is. But just but before I get drawn into this, let's make it perfectly clear that the captain of the parish doesn't really have an option. If 12 people write to the captain of the parish and request a meeting, if 12 of you wrote to me and asked for a meeting to decide whether the moon was made of green cheese, I would have to hold that meeting. And that is it, because you have to do it. Uh, you, you are not, the captain of the parish isn't actually definitely obliged to do it, but if he didn't do it, um, then it wouldn't be fair on the people calling the meeting, would it? So, but that, that is all we are here to do today. I'm here to call the meeting and take let, let the debate continue, uh, and, that, and that was it. So from that point of view, um, it is a, a, an avenue or a vehicle for people to air their views, shall we say. Um, Edwin. Edwin, please. Mr Chairman, Mr Smith, um, for public record, I'd like to make it known that I wasn't one of the people who called. <laughs> 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 I stood at the front end and um, told the public. Um, we're going round in circles. Um, what do those people who called the meeting, if any of them are present here this evening, hope to achieve mm -hmm. and how do we conclude this matter? We could be here all night and still not get anywhere. Um, the subject is a very emotive subject. It is a subject that Internationally, there isn't a solution or a general consensus. Um, so I don't think that we have enough people in the room to actually solve the problems of the world. What we do need to do is to solve the problem that has been brought to the captain of the parish via the people who um, have written to him and move forward from it. Um, just for the... No, I'm sorry, Mr. I don't want to tell Can I just uh, comment on what Andrew said about freedom of information and getting the name of the requisitions? That is a piece of information that wouldn't be released under GDPR, freedom of information or not. I'm, I have to say, I don't know the answer whether that's right or not. Um, there was a lady at the back, uh, on the back row there, Lots of lady next to you, did you wish to ask your question? You said that nobody was interested in assisted dying. He only ever spoke to one person from Onkan on the doorstep. And you were supporting assisted dying. You actually came to my house and we had a big conversation about it. Yeah. And you supported assisted dying. I don't believe that was true. So how many more people I don't have you spoken to? And they said the same. I've been a nurse for 30 years looking after patients and watching them at the end of life. And I would agree with the system that in some cases people should have a choice what happens to them, how much pain they can take at the end of life. It should not be down to religion. Dr. Ben. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, um, I, as you know, I'm not a uh, constituent of Garth. I, I was uh, invited to come along or, 
we suspect invited a representative from the office to come along and in case there are any, uh, any questions that we could help with so that, so that the, a sensible debate could be had here. Clearly there's a, the, the, the whole issue about um, having one view and then changing it. Uh, that that um, is another issue. I have to say that uh, reflecting back on the debate um, only two years ago now, in January 2020, when a motion was put to Timbald <clears throat> that uh, a citadine would come in. And it was interesting, it, um, that all happened over is, about is this, 10 days. Mr. Uh, Captain Cullen, is this relevant to actually what the meeting was about, which was the allegation that well, it may the, be the sitting government had misled I think, think we have to give people a little bit of latitude. We have given other speakers, yourself included, a bit of latitude. So I think it's only fair to give some... I think it's only fair, sir. I think it is only fair to let somebody else have a little bit of latitude. Thank you. So, um, in, in the, in the run-up to that, um, it was interesting how uh, the opinions of many NHKs changed and matured uh, as the, the vote came near. And, and ultimately, um, ultimately, it was a unanimous uh, vote uh, to essentially reject assisted dying at that point, despite the fact that quite a few MHKs had actually expressed views towards it uh, prior to the, the vote. Uh, and so, um, my personal view is that um, assisted dying superficially uh, is quite an attractive thing. We all like to have choices. Uh, but I truly believe that the Alamance Society would be worse for assisted dying legislation. Um, I, it, it would, it would change, the dynamic would change from, from a choice to being an obligation. Um, as I say, in, in 30 years of practice at the hospice, no patient has ever come to me and said, I want you to end my life uh, before, you know, before it, it's time. Um, much more concerned about symptoms being uh, dealt with um, and, and de uh, receiving the relevant amount of care um, that, uh, <coughs> that, that they need uh, and retaining as much dignity as possible uh, as, they, as they head towards the end of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Captain of the Parish, I'm sure all my skill isn't up to bringing this debate to an end, although some of us have not feel that we have gone round and round and round. But I think that the one thing that is going to persist in the future, the one thing that will be important long after this criticism of Andrew has died down, is that the whole business of euthanasia has been hijacked. Mm -hmm. It is no longer what it set out to be a last resort. Mm -hmm. It has become the norm. Mm -hmm. In Germany it is now a constitutional right. In Holland, teenagers can choose to die because they are tired of life. Mm -hmm. It has gone far, far beyond mm -hmm. what was intended. And if Andrew has discovered this in his studies, uh, there are others, I think, in this room who have also come to that same conclusion. Mm -hmm. It is extraordinarily dangerous. Mm -hmm. And uh, personally, I made a study of it, and I'm quite happy to send that study to anyone who would be interested. My email address is very simple and easy to remember, generalnew at max.net, or the lower case. And I'm quite happy to share the horrendous developments that are taking place in Canada, in Germany, in uh, Belgium, in Luxembourg, and above all, in Holland, where during the war, the Dutch exposed themselves to hideous danger in order to protect the Jews in their, in their company. They exposed themselves to death and their families to death from the Germans to try to protect the Jews. And now today, they are apparently acquiescent on tens of thousands of their citizens having their death prematurely. I do hope in the long term we will remember that this is an extraordinarily dangerous freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Captain Parish. Andrew knows me, we've spoken about this, Martin knows me as well. Most of you have been discussing it. I had a sort of a situation where I got deeper, where we stepped down, wanted to go to Switzerland, as he said, we put down by the dog. He didn't want to suffer because he got cancer. Peacefully and gladly, he died before that situation came about. We looked into it, looked into it properly, and looked into the alternatives. These alternatives a bottle of whiskey and a paracetamols. They all saw the problems with nursing, and I understand you've got a bad job, bad situation to deal with. When everybody talks about assisted dying, what they don't talk about is the person that has to inflict the injection or the tablet or anything. American mm -hmm. Marines, everybody naturally has an automatic not to kill inside you. American Marines have to be trained 28 days, 14 hours a day to override the natural reaction to kill so it becomes an habit. To kill somebody when you've took an oath to save life has to be a big establishment, that's the right thing. Yeah. How does that person delivering that injection or the tablet, however, live with it? Has anybody here thought about the other consequences of the other side? Mm -hmm. I know two people that's died of cancer and one said to the doctor, when are you going to put me out of the misery? And the doctor clearly stated to him, just keep feeding yourself with morphine. I know it's a bad situation, I'm not against assisted dying, but it has to be done correctly. Dr. Allison's moved his function forward. His nickname's Dr. Death. Is he going to be the man that takes responsibility for every jab that goes into a person to eliminate their life? There's other sides of the fact. You have to think about the hospital staff, the nursing staff. There's a big article. It can't be run away. It's just a freebie if you're fed up with life. These alternatives, it's a sad situation really. It's not been sorted, but you've got to just not look at the person who's ill. You've got to look at the medical staff and who's prepared to do it. Mr Perkins. Thank you. I think bringing the evening to a close, I uh, thank everybody that's come along this evening. I was one of the people that actually wrote to Mr. the captain of the parish, amongst other people. And I think that the, the whole issue is about saying one thing in the hustings and doing something else when you actually get in. And at least this evening we've shown any prospective candidate that they have to be very careful on what they say at the hustings because they will be held to account in this manner when they actually get into power. Maybe at the back in the yellow. Can I just ask one question? When did your research begin? When did your research into assisted dying begin? Was it for this meeting or was it before? How no. long has your research been going on for? I started researching it as soon as I, um, I, I came out of the meeting at Studio One, which was the date in sep was it September sometime in 21, the date, before the election. So I know you've looked into other countries. Have you actually looked into Denmark that do seem to have got it right, or both? You can have it right for assisted dying. Yeah, well, we'll start, I've started looking at Denmark, but obviously there's... It's a, it's Is a, it Denmark you have, you have to have three different doctors to say yes, you can go through with it, and there is one particular doctor that goes around, it's done very similar to how you put down a dog, which obviously is not the way to do it, but it's very calm, it's, and it, it's very calm, you can say goodbyes properly in a calming environment. So Denmark does have a problem. There's also Australia that needs to be looked at, there's lots and lots of other countries, it's not just Netherlands and Canada. There is more countries that have now legalised it. But I just wanted to know when you started your research, that was all. Yeah, that was right, this last week in particular, September. or whether it was for after last September. the slip of the tongue. I have one more. Okay, last question. Thank you. Well, I've seen kidney patients that you wouldn't give tums for, nursed with the right treatment back to, back to health. And I'm very scared that people will be encouraged to have this, this treatment when really it isn't the best thing for them. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Hang on, Mr. Jeff. One second, sir, please. I'd just like to say, you know, you're talking about faith. The 
When they have a sitting of Parliament, the first thing that they do, I believe, is they read Psalm 67, is that right? Yeah. Every single time they have a sitting at Tyndall. And then, of course, on Tyndall Day, they have the big ceremony inside the church. Christian ceremony. If that was not important in the Isle of Man, then they wouldn't do it. So all of the MHKs are supposed to recite that from piece of paper that they have or the Bible. So why is it that that is not considered in the Isle of Man? There are many people in the Isle of Man, just because we have some who don't believe, it doesn't mean that we are going to shun those that do. And I think that because Mr. Smith has actually stood up and made his conviction, and also because he has explained that he is a man of integrity, I believe that what he has done is right in his way of understanding. He can change his mind. People change their mind. Most of the manifestos didn't have anything in there at all about uh, assisted dying. And yet when it came to the vote, they voted for it. What were, they, what were their thoughts before that? Just because they hadn't said what they were, when it came to actually doing it, they, they voted in the way that they believed that they should vote. So I think that um, there's been a, a lot of uh, things said here tonight which I think are not correct and that I think that... Uh, I'm not from this parish, by the way. I came because I'm interested in this, uh, hearing what people had to say. But I believe that you have a really good MHK here in your um, constitution and that he should be supported in every way. One, because he has a faith. He has morals, mm -hmm. and in the end, God will have the last say. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up from what Edward had to say about how you know, we actually resolve this issue, and that is basically, Andrew, if you made a commitment in your manifesto or in your election about a subject, Will you make a commitment here and now that if you feel as though you're going to change that uh, view, that you will hold a public meeting so that you can actually explain to the people before you announce it in will your change of decision? So we, you know, we get the news before rather than after. Is that what is that the norm for MHK? Yeah, well, or are you, you actually, are you asking me to step outside the norm? No, it's not outside the norm. It is you are a representative, and therefore communicating with your electorate is a very important part of your job. And so far, my understanding is that your communication with your electorate has been almost well. I haven't seen any. Well, I've, we've had, I've had political surgery. Yeah. You are others send out regular newsletters for a start to their constituents. Have you ever sent out a single one since not, you got elected? Not, not since I got elected. No. no. Well, there you are. There's a start. Would you like me to do that? Would you yes. like a newsletter? There you go. Yeah. Where do you but, live? You, but, do you live in Garth? But, do, you live, do you live in Garth? He does. I yes. do, yeah. yeah. That's good. Cool. You get so, one. So, so yes. You know, you um, as another, you know, publicly elected representative. Yeah. Yes. No, no, communication no. with the public is an important. Mm. That's no, that's, that's no issue. If you want a newsletter, you can have a newsletter. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I think I think we are sort of going around in circles. And um, whether you feel that this meeting has been of help or useful is entirely up to yourselves. But what I would like to say is that I would thank everybody uh, because everybody has conducted themselves in a polite and gracious way this evening and it may have gone the other way um, including uh, Mr. Smith who as I said I have no power to make to compel Mr. Smith to come and talk here tonight he's come along of himself to explain his position and uh, but it does it is obvious from the discussion here tonight that there are two diametrically opposed views on this and it is obvious that at this moment never the twain are going to meet um, not for some time, possibly, and who knows. But I'd just like to thank everybody for coming tonight uh, to the meeting, and uh, I think everybody that wanted to ask a question has had the opportunity to so do, uh, and uh, I would just like to draw the meeting to a close. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you. Very much.